Welcome to the end of day two. It's going to be an incredible seven days ahead, another week of this, of overloading your brain and having blow your mind ideas. Uh, I put on the slide here as the title of this talk, the best way to predict the future is create it yourself. That's been my philosophy in life. And it's something which I fundamentally believe. I believe that one's attitude on how you take things on is everything. And I believe that every single problem we have can be solved. It's a matter of the right mental focus, persistence, the right technology, and the right capital. And once you do that, nothing can stand in the way of your intent. So, I want to start with the idea of attitude and how you attack things. A few decades ago, when I was starting International Space University, a friend of mine had on his wall Murphy's Law. And you probably have heard this, you know, if anything go wrong, it will. And I hated that idea. I just hated it. It just, it just didn't sit with me. And so I went up to, I didn't have a whiteboard, I had a you know, piece of paper and I wrote my own law. If anything can go wrong, fix it. To hell with Murphy. Then I started writing down what I believe, and if at the end of the day you want to know my uh, user's manual, well, they're called Peter's Laws. Go like this. When given a choice, take both. Start at the top, then work your way up. When forced to compromise, ask for more. If you can't win, change the rules. Of course, if you can't change the rules, then ignore them. When faced without a challenge, make one. No simply means begin again at one level higher. One of my favorites, when in doubt, think. It's so amazing how much people don't stop and think. You get what you incentivize. How true is that? I'll come back to these in the course of my talk. Without a target, you'll miss it every time. That's something a good friend of mine, Byron Lichtenberg, used to say all the time. If you can't measure it, you can improve it. Finally, the day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. So where in the world do we allow for crazy ideas to come about? Because if you're always trying to protect what you have, whether you're a large company or a government, then you're stuck with incremental progress. But if you really want breakthroughs, then you need to be thinking in outlandish ways, ways that may jeopardize your purse, your reputation, and who you are. But if you're right, and if you're right, what an amazing payoff. So I want to put my talk a little bit in context, and I'm a space enthusiast since the age of nine. If you had a mission in life, it was to get not myself, but humanity off the planet. We'll come back to that in a little bit. One of my favorite photographs, this is the Hubble Deep Field photo, they took the Hubble telescope and they pointed it towards the darkest place in the sky. And every single image you see on here, bar one of them, I think, is a galaxy. So each of these is a hundred billion stars for each of those little blips of light. And each of those constitute our universe of a hundred billion galaxies. And how many universes we have, who knows. But at the end of the day, if you stop and you think about who we are as a species, we're arguably, what, a few hundred years old as a technological species? In a universe of 14 billion years on a planet of 5 billion years? I mean, how much do we really, really know? And how much do we have yet ahead of us? We used to think that the Earth was the center of the universe. We used to think that you know, black holes were some anomalies. Now we're finding them as the causative agent in the center of all galaxies. We used to wonder whether there were other planets out there. Now every place we're looking, we're finding planets. And we wonder if there's life in the universe. And I happen to think it's ubiquitous. And Ray and I may differ on that point. But we can have a talk about that over a glass of wine later. But when I stop and I think about this, I realize how much there is left to find. How the questions we have are just the very beginning and how much change we have ahead of us in our lifetime. So part of what I think about is where is humanity going? And if you realize that a million years from now, 
we're talked about 10,000 years as being a long time. A million years from now, if we're able to keep records, we're going to look back at these next few decades as the moment in time that the human race irreversibly moved off the planet to the stars. This happened once before, a few hundred million years ago, when life moved out of the oceans onto land. But you, right now, your lifetimes, not your kids, your lifetimes, the human race is making a transition off of planet Earth irreversibly to the stars. I mean, that's a very powerful thought. And how we make that transition to the stars is going to forever affect what languages are spoken, what cultures are practiced, and with what ethos we are moving out beyond the Earth. Do you recognize that? Do you feel what that means? There's a tremendous responsibility. Now, we may go to the moon and we may end up building domes. In fact, it's a nice whimsical image. Yes, Tom, whimsical image. Uh, the fact of the matter is the best place to do this are in the lava tubes under the moon's surface where lava had once flowed. There are these large tubes, probably, you know, hundreds of meters in diameter, and we've seen them in some radar, and we've seen openings in the moon. And I want you to imagine that we will have the ability in this one-sixth gravity environment to strap on a pair of human-powered wings in one-sixth G and take flight. And how cool would that be? One of the discoveries made by some friends of ours here at NASA Ames not, you know, half a year ago was that on the south pole of this moon, in the deepest crevices are large reserves of cometary ice and hydrocarbons. Folks, that is probably one of the most significant discoveries of the last few decades. Because that ice on the South Pole, which is right next to these large peaks of eternal light, because the moon as it's rotating on its axis once every 28 days has sunlight that becomes incident to these peaks where you can put solar cells and you can bake down, break down the water to hydrogen and oxygen, rocket fuel. So the Saudi oil fields, if you would, of the space generation are on the south poles of the moons and those can fuel our human expansion. And we may not uh, set up large colonies on the moon, perhaps we will. Some are arguing we go to Mars and we were having some discussions last night late in the NASA Lodge about how you might terraform Mars by putting large black um, particulates on the, on the CO2 caps and melting those, or barraging Mars with comets and causing an atmosphere to come, or having Andrew Hessel bioengineer some bugs for us and dropping them on the surface and allowing them to do the work for us. But ultimately, my friend Greg Marinek and I, uh, paying tribute to Gerard K. O'Neill, would much rather not go down into the gravity uh, wells of Mars, but instead use AI and robotics and nanotechnology to build yourselves amazing O'Neill colonies. There is so much material out there, asteroids, comets, leftover bits from the creation of our solar system. You can go and capture, they're in very low gravity wells, move them together, and they're raw materials to build yourself an absolutely beautiful home where you can, as you get older and older, you can move up the hill to where the gravity is less and then strap on those wings and fly along the center of this O'Neill sphere. So, one of the most important insights that has hit me at SU is the following concept. I know Ray spoke about this a little bit, but I want to hit it again. That we evolved as humans to be local and linear. It means that we grew up, our brains are designed to think about the local community and tribes. That's why in one sense, when you see a kid who's hungry, that a face of one individual hits you much harder than the face of a thousand kids. Your ability to communicate and your brain imprints on one individual. That's why you care about you know, the news about uh, uh, Britney Spears. I mean, who cares about Britney Spears? But when you hear about it, you sort of can't help but wanting to know what disaster she's in again. And that sort of social structure has come from the local desires that our brain grew up around. The linear function that we understand linear, we understand when a rock's being thrown at us, we can figure out when it's going to hit us. 
But the fact of the matter is we, we've grown up in this way, right? A thousand years ago, the life of your great-grandfather and the life of your children were basically the same. There might have been a, a new king or a new queen, but how you fed yourselves, what you told around the campfire, was the same over three, four, five generations. Nothing changed. Today, the difference between you and your kid or you and your parents is enormous. And so we're living in a world today that's global and exponential. And it's that difference right here, this difference between the exponential curve and the linear curve that we've grown up that is this disruptive stress. And this, folks, is what's causing billion dollar companies to go out of business and billion dollar companies to come out of no place. And it's causing governments to fold overnight. The fact that governments can't prepare for or anticipate you know, the fact that change is happening and that unless they are flexible enough to change with it, the change isn't going to stop. They will. So this is a friend of mine, Gene Cernan, the last human on the moon so far. This is December 1972. And Gene is jumping off the lunar surface. Okay, he is basically a meter off the ground, wearing 400 pounds of equipment. And Gene said during a lecture, you know, we went from never having flown anybody on the moon in 1961 to landing on it in eight and a half years. You tell me what's impossible. Nothing, nothing is impossible. I never forget that. The notion that in 1961, JFK said, we're going to the moon before the end of this decade, and 400,000 Americans left their jobs, left school, left work, and they descended on places like Titusville, Florida, and Huntsville, Alabama, and they invented everything that was needed to go to the moon. We had never put a person in orbit before. We had no right to make this claim that we could go to the moon. No right. And we invented the propulsion, the navigation and guidance, the rendezvous and docking, the structures, everything. The average age of the engineers who built those systems, any guesses? Yeah, mid to late 20s. They didn't know what couldn't be done. There was no one there to tell them, uh, you can't do it that way. We haven't done it that way before. They were given a clean sheet of paper, and they invented it. The same thing happened in the early 90s when the dot-com revolution was started. Again, average age of the engineers who were building the dot-com companies just out of college, leaving college. The average age of a Nobel laureate's work in their late 20s. So I tell the CEOs in the audience always, next time someone in their mid-20s comes to you with a crazy idea, listen, it may be a brilliant one. Nothing is impossible. So I focus my life on breakthroughs. You know, this is our motto here at SU. We have, during the summer project, these 10 to the 9th plus projects. How do you affect a billion people positively in 10 years? That's the question we ask students to think about. I mean, that's when it really matters, right? When you're working on something that can impact the world on that scale, on that level. And if you have a choice, why wouldn't you want to do something like that? So I think about breakthroughs all the time. What drives breakthroughs? What is the, the impetus? What causes some person to make it happen and other people not to? Well, there are four basic drivers for breakthroughs. The first is fear. This is JFK. I want you to imagine 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik. 1961, they eat our lunch again. They, they launch Yuri Gagarin. And out of that fear, we commit to going to the moon before the end of the decade. An outlandish statement, but yet we did it. Another driver is curiosity. Is there life out there in the universe? So curiosity is a pretty weak motivator, unfortunately. I know it's a persistent motivator. But in society, if you stop and you think about how much fear motivates you versus how much curiosity motivates you, it's actually measurable. It's the ratio of the defense budget to the science budget. <laughs> Wealth creation, a huge motivator, a motivator over time. Look at this, this deep sea oil platform. Can you imagine the chutzpah, the, the you know, 
amazing audacity of someone saying, we're going to build this in Scandinavia. We're going to move it to the other side of the planet into the North Sea, where the most ferocious oceans are. We're going to plummet this down through miles of ocean into the crust and pull out oil. I mean, I have to imagine the first time that was ever proposed, people probably laughed. But yet we do these things now, these multi-tens of billion dollar uh, commitments to huge capital because of the potential for the hundreds of billions of wealth that can be created. And finally, human significance. Perhaps one of the most important drivers that drives you deep in your soul the significance of wanting to make your life worth something on this planet while you're here. And I know most of you are driven to do great things, and there are other drivers, love, you know, connection, but significance drives many. And it was this man, Charles Lindbergh, who in 1927 responded to this incentive prize put up by Raymond Ortega. So let me tell the story. This is a story that came to me because my good friend Greg Marinette gave me a copy of The Spirit of St. Louis, trying to incentivize me to finish my pilot's license. Little did he know the consequences would be the X Prize out of that and my dragging him from Princeton to St. Louis to come join me there. So in 1919, this Frenchman, Raymond Ortega, who had moved from New York to Paris and became a, a, a busboy at a hotel, worked his way up eventually bought the hotel, bought a second hotel, loved aviation. And he decided that he was going to offer a prize for the first person to fly between New York and Paris, or Paris and New York. But if you understood the trade winds, you'd probably go from New York to Paris. And incredibly, this $25,000 prize in 1919 drove nine different teams to spend $400,000 to win 25000 bucks. Incredible. The most important thing, though, was not the fact that Lindbergh made it. Lindbergh was the most unlikely guy to do it. The most likely guy to do it was a guy, Admiral Byrd, who in, 19, um, in 1927, just before Lindbergh flew, crashed on takeoff because he had overweighted his airplane with champagne in China. So he could celebrate when he gets to Paris as if there would be no champagne in China in Paris when he gets there. I, I didn't get that one. But Lindbergh makes this flight. And in 33 and a half hours, he becomes the most famous human on the planet. Still to this day, kids learn about him in school. But it wasn't like he proved new technology, but the audacity of his act, the heroism of his act. It changed the way people thought. And for me, the most significant thing was the numbers that followed. Between 1927 and 1929, in 18 months, the number of passengers in the United States went from 6,000 to 180,000, a 30-fold increase. There was this dramatic demonstration that Lindbergh had changed the way the people thought about aviation. And so an important lesson for you is you're looking to cause breakthroughs. The technology may not be enough. The most difficult thing is changing how people think. And sometimes when people are stuck in the way they think, they need a dramatic demonstration. And that's what Lindbergh did. We went from aeronauts and daredevils before he flew to pilots and passengers. So I became enamored with prizes. Wow! You put up $25,000 and they spend $400,000 to win it? How cool is that? So I started researching prizes and learned that the first major prize, the Longitude Prize in the 1700s, was put up. Uh, it was People knew their latitude, but didn't know their longitude, and the British Admiralty were losing thousands of seamen on the rocks because they were not knowing where they were, and they couldn't avoid the dangers. And so they put up this prize, and they expected it to be won by an, astro uh, an astronomer using astronomical clocks, the moons of Jupiter. But if it was cloudy, you couldn't look at the moons of Jupiter. And so this man, John Harrison, won it by being the most precise clockmaker ever. And here you see uh, H2 and H3, the timekeeper that won him that longitude prize. But in fact, because the longitude board that was the judging agency really knew it was going to be won by an astronomer, they resisted for decades to give him the prize, even though it was the solution that finally uh, was the solution that was used. 
So our preconceived notions of how we expect things to be and how we want things to stay the same is one of the most important psychological issues that we have to deal with in building new industries and in looking at exponential growth. It may not be enough. Do you remember those friends of yours who when email came out or your parents or your grandparents said, oh, this email thing, I'm never going to use it. You know, I'm going to write letters. And they were resistant, but eventually that broke. So when I finished reading the uh, Spirit of St. Louis, the idea of this prize came to mind because it, deep inside, I'm a nine-year-old kid who wanted to fly into space, and I had met enough astronauts, a good friend of mine, Byron Lichtenberg, who's one of the early co-founders of uh, the X Prize as well, and Byron said to me, Peter, if you're going to fly, your chances of being selected are one in a thousand, and even if you're selected, you really have to be a really good boy and do what you're told to get a flight assignment. And I said, uh, that's just not me. <laughs> Our good friend Dan Barry over there, how many times did you apply for the astronaut corps? Fourteen. Fourteen times. Fourteen, that's persistence, ladies and gentlemen. That's persistence. And then three flights after that. And I guarantee you, had I been accepted, had I applied 15 times, and had been lucky enough, I probably would have been kicked out from not doing the right things at the right time. Once you're in, everybody's fine. Okay, well. Anyway, I decided actively not to apply and said, I'm going to go and do this thing privately. And the idea of the X Prize came to my mind by the time I had finished reading this book. And the concept was a simple one. I wanted to create an incentive prize to create a new generation of private spaceships to carry me and the rest of you into space. And I didn't know who was going to put up the name and the money to be my Orteg, so I called it the X Prize, a variable to be replaced by the name of the person putting up the money. <laughs> yes, true. It also meant Roman numeral 10, which was cool, and you know, X for experimental. It really worked. And so it just took me so long to find the Ansari family who put up the money for our first prize. The X stuck around. So the X Prize was $10 million. It was enough money to attract the entrepreneurs, but not to turn the heads of the large aerospace giants. I didn't want them competing. I didn't want them spending you know, $100 million to win a $10 million prize. I wanted people to do this differently. One of the best ways to drive innovation is to constrain the problem. If you constrain it to a place where the old ideas don't work, then you de facto are driving innovation. So remember that point. So $10 million, privately funded. I wanted them to worry about every penny they spent. A three-person spaceship meant at the end of the competition, this could go into business with a pilot and two paying passengers or an autopilot and three very brave passengers. 100 kilometers altitude was officially space. Now, everybody said to me, Diamandis, if you're not going to orbit, it doesn't matter. And I knew the physics, that it was 50 times harder energetically. You know, you're doing Mach 3 instead of Mach 25, and energy is a square of the velocity. And I said, if it's 50 times harder, no one's going to win it, and no one's going to care, and it's never going to move any place. So we chose a suborbital flight, like Alan Shepard, going up into space, coming back down. And then two flights within two weeks meant that the cost of the second flight was the fuel and the touch labor. Very simple. Well, amazingly, we had 26 teams from seven countries around the world who spent $100 million to win the prize. The best part of it was that we explored a wide range of designs. I remember Greg and I sitting down and trying to figure out what approaches might we take. We created this matrix of, you know, solid, hybrid, liquid engines, vertical takeoff, horizontal takeoff, helicopter first stage, balloon first stage, and every single approach was tried. We received teams from around the planet. But by putting up a prize, you automatically backed the winner, and you backed all of the approaches, not just the one you thought in advance might be the winner, not the Admiral Byrd when you had the Lindbergh there. We got on the front page of Google. That was really cool. Keith Powers, working with his friend Mike uh, Frumkin, you know, said, hey, it'd be really cool, and there we were. Thank you, Keith, for that. 
We've got six billion media impressions. And best of all, Spaceship One is now hanging in the Air and Space Museum, right above the Apollo 11 capsule, and next to the Spirit of St. Louis that inspired it. How cool is that, huh? So I want to take you back. We're going to roll to video now, so let's make sure the sound is up, to those winning flights. The X Prize, a $10 million contest. The privately built spaceship that's able to carry three individuals flying to 100 kilometers of altitude and do that twice inside of two weeks. Find your fun new job with the Exotic X Prize. The X Prize Foundation ignited a new race to space, luring teams from around the globe. We're based in Mojave, California, Israel, Oklahoma, Forks, Washington, Romania. Acting as the catalyst, the XPRIZE Foundation demonstrated an incentivized competition can change the world. So prizes work. One of my other favorite prizes was the DARPA Grand Challenge. So it turns out the Defense Department, and you've heard a little bit about this before, the Defense Department really wanted to be able to create autonomous supply lines, be able to feed the troops, carry supplies, and between 1980 and 2000 they funded 200 million dollars of research, asking them to be able to take cars over 100 kilometers distance, 100 percent autonomously. Well, the best that they did was, as we discussed before, uh, you know, 95 percent of the way autonomously, but the hardest 5 percent still had to be driven by the human and they were going at three to five miles an hour. 9-11 happens, we invade, DARPA says we've got to solve this problem. And they put up the DARPA Grand Challenge. A million dollars the first year they ran it, two million dollars the second year they ran it, about 85 contestants entered, about 25 or so actually ran the competition. And you can see all the different designs here. What hit me in speaking to uh, the, the teams at DARPA was the fact that they came at this from a wide range of approaches. And here on the second year was run is won. No one won the first year, but the second year was won. I think six teams actually completed the challenge. And Stanford, with their Stanley vehicle, won it. And here they are getting the $2 million check. But the numbers speak for themselves. $20 million, $200 million, thousands of human years, and a dismal failure compared to the team from Stanford, about 20 grad students, $500,000 in a year of time. They actually did nothing in the first year, started at the beginning of the second year, and won it. I mean, incredible that these guys would go after this and win it so quickly. Now, of course, they built on the heels of success, but they also brought new ideas to it. And the fact that if a, you know, if a challenge hasn't been solved, what happens is people say, well, this is insolvable. But it's insolvable for them. It doesn't mean it can't be solved. And the mindset is so important. I'm going to come back, come back to this. The mindset of how you attack problems is so critical. Another example, a friend of mine, Rob McEwen. So Rob is a Canadian and is celebrating here tonight, like everybody else in the world, for the winning of, of Canada, the gold medal. Uh, he's up in Ontario. And uh, about 2000, 2001, he bought a gold mine. And in that gold mine, he asked his scientists and engineers, where is the gold located? How much is it? How much is there and how, much can I, how can I get it out? And they didn't give him the answer he wanted. So what did he do? He took all of the geological data of his gold mine, which is considered the family jewels for any, any mining company. Instead of locking it up in the safe, he stuck this data up on the web for everybody to see. In fact, it was so much data that he had to ship it out by FedEx on drives. And he asked the people out there, how many of you can tell me where the next 20,000 ounces of gold is going to come from? He had about 80-odd groups come in. 
The top three of them, I'm sorry, uh, we asked when the next six million ounces are going to come from. The top three of them identified where the next six million ounces are going to come from, and they generated six billion dollars worth of gold from a $500,000 challenge. Now, the best thing is that the three teams that won this competition were, I think, from New Zealand and Australia and Russia, and had never even been to his gold mine. They did this all remotely, looking at the data on their computer. And he never knew any of these people. Had he wanted to find them, he could not have. He crowdsourced this, and it took his company from a $50 million valuation to a $2.7 billion valuation. That's a pretty good return. So at the X Prize right now, we are looking at prizes in four different group areas. And I'll come to these in a little bit. And one of the things that I, as I think about X Prize, X Prize is setting these objective goals. And SU, all of you and the students during the summer are, in my mind, the groups and the teams that will compete for Either one helped me de design those prizes, but ultimately form teams to go and compete and win these competitions. So let's talk about designing incentive prizes. Here are the attributes. I'm always looking for prizes that are targeting stuck areas, market failures. If capitalism is doing a great job, there's no reason for a prize. But if something is stuck because there's a union, because people believe it's impossible, because capital's not flowing in, there's a stigma, whatever it might be, Clear, objective, measurable rules. Something that's hard but attainable. Taking it from orbit, for example, to 100 kilometers suborbital was still hard but attainable. Something could be run in three to eight years. If it was a prize that's won in less than three years, it was too easy. More than eight years, no one cares anymore. And then defining a problem without a solution. We launch prizes above the line of super credibility. I'll speak to that later. Make sure there's a business back end. So when the prize is won, we want there to be an industry launched after this. It's not enough to have the thing sitting in a museum, open around the world, tenogenic. If we do our job right, we attract new capital to the marketplace. So Paul Allen backed Burt Rutan with $26 million to go and win the Ansari X Prize. And the structure of the competition allows you to attract billionaires. And today, we've got 1,500 or so billionaires on the planet. And they love challenges, transitioning from success to significance. If we do our job right, we overcome existing constraints, both psychological and regulatory, drive new regulatory frameworks. There was no laws that allowed for private space flight when the Ansari X Prize was won, or before it was won. We actually had to get the FAA to change the rules. My meeting with Marion Blakey, the FAA administrator, looks something like this. You know, teams are going to have to go and win this thing outside the US because they can't do it here. She said, we'll have to change that. And they did. We work to make heroes out of the teams, launch a new industry. You know, we encourage risk taking. And guys, this is one of the points I want to hit home. Without taking risk, you can't have breakthroughs. And if we are so stuck and so risk adverse, you know, it's what Dan said on the first day, you know, the old NASA motto, failure is not an option. Well, failure is not an option, either is innovation and breakthroughs. And I'll speak more about that in a little bit. Encourage cross-disciplinary solutions, and most important, changing the paradigm of what is possible. The single most important thing we can do is change what people believe is possible. So this is what happened with the Ansari X Prize. It was highly leveraged. We drove a $10 million prize to $100 million of expenditures by the teams. That's typical of an incentive prize. It's done well. You only pay the winner. It's super efficient. And the best part of it is you spark a whole new industry. We went from $2.5 million the St. Louis community gave us to $10 million from the Ansari family, to $100 million of team expenditures, to over a billion dollars invested by the world in the suborbital industry. I mentioned this in the very beginning. State of mind. What you believe is possible is so critical. If you think something is impossible, then you're right. It is for you. 
As soon as you say, I can't do something, then you can't. And so believing, truly believing in your heart that you can do it, is the first and most important thing that you have to do, no matter what it is. And one of the things when you launch a large incentive prize and stand up there in front of the world and say, this is worth doing and it's doable, that's the most important thing one of these incentive prizes do, does. Henry Ford said this, you know, the moment one gets into the expert state of mind, a great number of things become impossible. And I define an expert as someone who can tell you exactly how something can't be done. So let's talk about this. Willingness to fail equals opportunity to innovate. So why do people resist failure? Why do people resist failure? Why do people hate to fail? Some answers, please. They're trained in school that uh, when you get the right answers on it. So. Great. They don't, want, they don't want to be embarrassed. They want, they want to perform. Other reasons? Cost. cost. Tell me more about cost. <coughs> Most people don't have the money to fail. Most people don't have the money to fail, and those that do uh, aren't necessarily willing to give, up, give it up. Great. Uh, also add to that to say, you've invested so much money, you're afraid to lose everything that you've invested so far. Other reasons? Please. Career uh, or, or other concerns where you feel if you, if you fail, that'll be the end of, of your opportunities going forward. Reputation. You're concerned that if you fail, you'll ruin your reputation and that's it. And in a lot of countries, that's true, isn't it? Once you have it, it used to be, it's much more true in Europe than it is here in the United States. And it used to be that if you fail, there was this great frontier. You could get on the railroad, get on your horse, and go to the West and change your name and start again, and who would ever know? Right? Now, you're thumbprints on the internet, and you can't go any place without being known. Anyone can do a search on you and, ah, oh, this guy failed. And depending on their mindset, they will say, that's great. He failed, so you know, he's likely not to make that same mistake again. Other reasons? Clee. Lack of confidence in one's creativity and innovation, because they might feel they might not get lucky enough to find another solution. Sure. Absolutely. Please. I'll give you a very orthogonal one. Yes, You're Stephen. You're allowed to fail by dictate by other people. So you're not, uh, your organization will, re you will refuse to f have you fail. NASA is a great example. Government agencies are a great example. Government, government writ large, the people that work there are good people that basically have been told you cannot fail, therefore do not risk. Absolutely. And in fact, if you fail, there's a congressional investigation that's going to take you out. Yes? Because I think a lot of people think, oh, I won't do that, something better will come along. All right. Any other reasons? Vijay. Um, many times people, or no, at least I tend to do this, uh, take uh, uh, an action that I've done as, uh, which has failed, and turn it into my own failure. You know, they take it personally. And it's psychologically, it's, it, it's a downer for them. So I, I put a few of these up here, worried about wasting the invested time. I invested all of this time, or all of this money. It's embarrassing. My reputation has been hurt. So what's the answer to that? How do you innovate even given those things? Let me throw out a couple of ideas, and let's discuss them. First of all, set the expectations. I'm going to fail at least 10 times as I develop this. Could you do that? Could you say, this is an experiment, expect us to fail 10 times, 20 times. And if you make it on the third time, oh my god, you're a hero. You know, when I did the Ansari X Prize, I told people, this is dangerous, someone may die. And well, why would I do that? Because if someone did die, bluntly, we'd warn them. And if no one did, such as we were lucky to have the case happen, they were far more the heroes. Reward failure with learning. One of my heroes, the more I learned about this man, Ratan Tata, who the chairman of Tata Industries from India, who's happened lucky enough to, <coughs> uh, to have him on our board at XPRIZE, they give an award every year <coughs> for the best failures. 
they have a culture of failure. They reward failure with learning. What an amazing thing. They not only allow for it, they reward it. Rapid iteration. Uh, a friend of mine from MIT had the 555 rule. The concept is you want to try something new, you break up into teams, you each get $5,000 in five weeks to try five ideas. Not to try them in a full blown out manner, but to try them a little bit and see which ones have an inkling of potential. You know, the marketing gurus know this. You test, test, test in your ads, right? You tweak different things. But what about doing that as well in your projects? So one of the teams who won the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander X Prize Challenge, well actually the two teams that won, John Carmack and, uh, and, and Dave um, Mastin, were both software engineers building rockets. And they went and they iterated over and over and over again. They tried, every day they flew something different. Very different from the aerospace industry that would do the other thing. We design, fully on paper, get the final designs, and we build the final hardware, then we fly it, and it better work. And since we can't afford to fly it twice, we're going to get in margin and margin and margin and margin. Oops, we're out of money. And they've just failed, even before flying anything. These guys would just iterate it every weekend, Tuesday nights and Saturdays. And then using incentive prizes. What do incentive prizes do on the failure front? Anybody get the connection there right away? Incentive prizes, if you're putting up a prize for an audacious breakthrough, what happens? Teams try, they fail. Is it your fault? No. Someone wins? Fantastic. You have just taken the risk off of your back and put it someplace else. So if you're a government that doesn't take risk and you have an audacious idea, put up a prize. It's off balance sheet risk taking. That risk doesn't fall on your, you know, you don't have egg on your face if no one wins. But if someone does, oh my god, that's a tremendous reward. So how do you maximize your chance for innovation and success? There are a number of basic ideas. We've talked about rapid prototyping, right? That's one idea. Other ideas for how, if you wanted to innovate inside of a large organization, what does that look like? Any ideas? Any? Please. Basically, it means, basically it means running a skunk works and hiding what you're doing from uh, your bosses. So you hit a lot, couple of good things. What does that go? What does a skunk works mean, and what is what are you hiding, and why? Uh, because you're off the agenda. You're doing something non-standard, so you're trying to keep it fast, small prototype and work out your ideas so you can get it ready before you have to tell anyone what you're doing. Great. Other, other thoughts? Please. You find, you find the people in the organization that share a passion for taking the risk and being creative and pull them together and pull the talent. Passion is probably one of the most critical attributes of the team that you want there. Please. Support from, support from the management team, and I think it's very key because otherwise, otherwise you don't get the resources uh, horizontally or vertically. Support, and I will say support in a certain way, and I'll come to that in a minute. We had something okay. back. Yes. So I, I'd add to that, it's not necessarily, again, different experiences. It's not support from a management team, it's support from at least one key leader who has the courage to support a small team. Getting an entire so that was, the, that was the variation, I, I would say. And yes, I fully, I fully agree. So uh, we have one last. Bob? I think you could also uh, cordon off some incentives within the incentive structure. So kind of like Google, uh, either a percentage of time or a percentage of money that goes off to the side and is sort of you know, on a different roulette table for innovation. Great. So I put down these, and it mirrors what you said. A small group. A small group. A small group, why a small group? You want the minimum amount of management overhead as possible. You want a group that can communicate, 10 people, 20 people. You don't want to have a management structure in that. You want a group that is literally being able to talk to each other and knows what everybody else's problems are so they can start to fix it among themselves, right? 
typically a young age or young of mindset at least. People who are, are afraid, are not afraid, and are willing to take crazy ideas and try them. Mixed with a few people who have the right connections and know what's been tried before, not to repeat those failures again. Diverse backgrounds. One of the most important things is diversity of backgrounds. People who come in with a completely different orthogonal point of view. That is critical. I mean, how many times do you have breakthrough ideas started by a person who was completely outside the company? Because they weren't stuck in the mindset of the expert. Powerful, impassioned vision. You know, having a clear and powerful vision that they wake up with every day and is their motivation is so important. Isolating them from the whole. You made that point uh, early on. Why? Because everybody else wants to tell them that they're crazy and their idea will never work. And so you want them as far away as possible so they're not polluted by the pre-existing mindset. And then you want these ideas, what I call, born above the line of super credibility. And let me speak about that one second. It's, for me, it's one of the most important things that we do at the XPRIZE. So we have in our brain this artificial line of credibility. And here it is. And if you announce something below the line of credibility, I announce that tomorrow morning, ladies and gentlemen, I'm flying to Mars, you know, you're going to say he's a crackpot. You dismiss it immediately. And you, in your, in your mind, you make these judgments all the time. If Bill Gates said, I'm funding a private mission to go to Mars in five years, that's pretty damn credible. And then, it's above the line of credibility, and then it depends how it goes over time. If it's going over time and then no progress is being made, you know, I think the Obama health care plan started credibly, and then as things start to wind down, it becomes uncredible. And, and you're making these judgments every day, right? And you're updating your credibility meter on that. And if things go well, then it sort of tends up. And then there is this line of super credibility. You know, if all of a sudden Bill Gates and Richard Branson and Larry Page and Paul Allen all announce a mission to going to Mars in 10 years, you go, holy shit, how am I going to get on that mission? There's this line of super credibility that people instantly accept it as real. No question, it's going to happen. So in 1996, when Greg Marinak and I and a group were announcing the X Prize, we didn't have the Ansaris on board, it was just called the X Prize back then. I didn't have any money, didn't have any teams, but we got up on stage under the arch in St. Louis, and I had the NASA administrator on one side, Dan Golden, and I had the associate administrator from the FAA on the other side. And I didn't have one astronaut, I had 20 astronauts on stage with me, with Buzz Aldrin, and the Lindbergh family there. And we announced this $10 million prize. And front page around the world, no one said you have the money, no one asked you have any teams, they just assumed it was real. <laughs> little did they know. <laughs> and little did I know how hard it was going to be for us to go and raise that money. But line of super credibility, when we announced SU, Salim and Susan and Bruce and the team worked very hard, and Bob worked very hard to <laughs> announce this above the line of super credibility. And it worked. And we got, you know, thousands of articles written and thousands of applicants for our graduate student program. And we're here today because of that. So remember that when you're announcing your next product or company or crazy idea. So where's the X Prize today? Um, we announced our next prize, and you've heard about this, and uh, we can revisit it in Tom's beautiful work here. But Craig Venter in 2001 spent about $100 million in a year's time to sequence his genome. And one genome is interesting, but not to get to thousands of genomes is it really uh, become valuable. And so uh, Craig is the co-chair of this, and it's a, uh, something called the Archon X Prize for Genomics. And it's the $10 million prize for the first team to sequence 100 human genomes in 10 days. It's a size and a rate. 
And one of the things that we do in these prizes that's very important is we define finish lines. So one of the things that we're doing here as well is defining what does a sequence genome mean? What error rate, what level of, of completion? Uh, and so that's one of the things that this is doing, is defining so that we have a, a gold standard for genome sequencing. As part of this, we're going to be sequencing 100 individuals, our genome 100. Uh, Steve, uh, Professor Stephen Hawking was the first, Paul Allen, Larry Page, Richard Branson, Michael J. Fox. About a third of the genome sequenced are well-known individuals. We'll be choosing about two-thirds from the public, probably different people from disease groups. And so that we're trying to change the paradigm to say, hey, whole genome sequencing is now available and something that we should all do for medical benefits. And so having these genome pioneers, having their genome sequenced first is part of that equation. The next prize that we launched in 2007 is the Google Lunar X Prize. Google put up $30 million. And this is for the first team to land a robot on the surface of the moon, send back photos and videos, rove a half a kilometer, send back more photos and videos. Uh, Bob Richards, was, uh, who is the CEO of Odyssey Moon, was the first to register. And we now have uh, 21 teams from around the world, from 12 countries around the world, who are building these vehicles. And at the end of the day, if we do our job right, or if they do their job right, we will have the ability to get to the moon for 10 times less, where any country or a company or a wealthy individual can send a rover to the moon. Remember, we now know where the most valuable real estate in the entire solar system is located, on the South Pole of the Moon. The prize, which is up and operating right now, which we won next, is called the Progressive Automotive X Prize. This is a $10 million prize for the fastest, most efficient cars on the planet. So we had 136 vehicles from 11 countries who registered to compete for this. Wide range of vehicles. And to win, they're going through a multi-stage race that starts at the end of April and goes through August in and around the Detroit, Michigan area. So these cars have to be affordable in unit sizes above 10,000. They have to be manufacturable. They've got to be safe past craft standards. They have to be fast because this is a speed race for the fastest car that still does over 100 miles per gallon or its energy equivalent. So one of the things we did in this competition is create a new metric called MPGE that allows you to compare electric against hybrids, against biofuels, against gas, against diesel, so that it's not a matter of the source, it's where the electrons are generated and the CO2 output of those. So we can compare apples and oranges, so to speak. And at the end of this, we're trying to change the paradigm that you don't have to choose. You can have it all. You can have a car that's beautiful, affordable, safe, fast, and oh, by the way, gets over 100 miles per gallon, and why would you want anything else? So where are we going next? We're looking at Ocean X Prizes. Eric Schmitz funded us to look at uh, Ocean X Prizes for getting humans to the Marianas Trench, or mapping the ocean floor, or mapping the ocean columns to know exactly what's going on. One of my favorites is Autonomous Car X Prize. And the form of that would either be uh, the deep blue equivalent, the first car to win against a top-seated human driver in a Grand Prix race. I think that would be really cool. Could you imagine? I believe that these cars, and if we launch this now, within five years, could win such a competition and avoid hitting anybody. Or the other option here is the first car to drive between LA and New York in under three days, fully autonomous, abiding by all the rules and regulations. For me, it's about the headlines, ushering in a new era of transportation. Because, as, my, as Kristen will tell me, uh, you know, humans are the worst drivers. And, and when I'm on my Blackberry, I'm the worst of the humans. <laughs> carbon sequestration, carbon capture. Now imagine an XPRIZE for a team that can uh, take out a metric ton within a certain number of uh, seconds and a certain number of joules. I'm looking for prizes that can be won by small teams of grad students who take a different approach. We're looking at uh, bionics, carrying on the work that, for example, Dean Kamen did for people who have lost their legs or lost use of their legs. So out of our XPRIZE lab at MIT, 
a Bionics X Prize, looking at being able to uh, take individuals who have lost their legs or lost use of their legs, be able to give them the full mobility. Basically, replace the wheelchair so they can get into a car, climb stairs, or climb a mountain. Brain-computer interface, we spend a whole day on this today. And we have just gone through a series of iterations, coming up with ideas. For me, it's one of the most exciting areas for a prize. You know, is it, uh, is it a prize for the first team who can transmit a 50-digit number in either direction between your mind and a computer? Or is it something as simple as having a four-bit ability to think A, B, C, or D and hooking it up to your iPhone so you have almost a, a telepathic power? Something very simple, which could be so profound. One of my favorite prizes, the AI physician. So this is taking you back to medicine and taking you back to artificial intelligence. This is how this prize would work. It looks something like this. To win, you've got to build an AI computer that can speak and listen in natural language. And that part's pretty much done right now. You have 10 patients outside the room. As the head of the competition, you know exactly what these 10 patients have. Inside the room, you have the AI and you have 10 board certified doctors. One at a time, the patients come in, sit down, and the doctors and the AI ask questions for an hour. Everybody hears the same questions, the same answers. At the end of that hour, the doctors write down what they think the patient has and what they should do. Patient leaves, next one walks in. All 10 patients go through that. At the end, when the AI is able to diagnose and give the correct course of treatment as good or better than the 10 board certified doctors, the AI wins. Simple, objective, a measurable competition. Here's the impact. By the end of 2013, 80 plus percent of the world's population will have a cell phone. That AI can speak Swahili and Mandarin in any language you want. <coughs> Anyone with a cell phone can call that AI and get board certified level advice. It's a transformation in how to support. It's going to happen first in Africa or a developing world because there are no lawyers there. But it's definitely a major breakthrough. Can the microphone up, yeah. please? Lots of docs will tell you that the last thing they want to do is diagnose over the phone or just go with, like, they want to see the patient. They want to get the ability to do you know, some basic stuff, look at a blood pressure or whatever. Are you not worried that that particular one might lead us into a diagnostic, di diagnostic mode that itself is a problem? So, great question. And this is, this is a medical function for, and Doug has a question as well over here, VJ. Um, do you, you get a question? Yeah. Uh, this is, for me, this is for the developing world where there are no doctors. And then it's for second opinions. And it's for, you know, we're going to start to get to a point where there will be tricorders. There will be medical devices that you wear. There will be collection of data from everywhere. And what you really need is, I mean, this falls on the heels of a study that Rand Corporation did 18 months ago that said 45% of the time you go to the doctor, you get the wrong course of treatment or the wrong diagnosis. Why? Because there is so much data that a doctor is having to analyze right now. I mean, I know when I went to medical school, I'd forgotten everything two or three years afterwards. And, and it's, it's not for everything but it sure is going to have a great niche. Doug? Uh, you started to answer the question already, but um, you, hear, you hear different figures on this, but the, the cost of health care is largely to do with chronic diseases and infidelity to the protocols prescribed, not the prescription. In other words, why did you pick diagnosis? That's not necessarily the big, ripest area. So we chose, we chose this because uh, Ray and I wanted to do an AI X Prize. And this was a limited touring test that would have consequences as well as the autonomous car. There are other medical areas, and in fact, you know, we can speak about that. But I'm just highlighting this as an example of an X Prize. And one of my goals is that you guys are all experts, intelligent. I'm looking for great X Prize ideas that I can bring to my board because it's the power of the idea that's so critical. Um, this is a great manifestation of exponential technology. Late 1950s, the X-15 program, a $1.5 billion program in 2004 dollars, flies one person 200 kilometers. Fast forward 40 years, three-person spaceship, 
built by 20 employees on the average, flying three people for $26 million. What a government used to do, a small team of 20 or 30 people can now do. The empowerment of people. I believe that we're about to aid, and, you know, enter an age of abundance. Most people think that, in fact, the world's going to be worse off for the next generation. That's the average expectations of populations today because of energy, environment, terrorism, pandemics, water problems, resource problems. In fact, I think it's going to be, we're going to live into an age of abundance and amazement. We're already living in an age of abundance when it comes to telephony and information. You know, uh, these two individuals in Africa have better telecom than the President of the United States did in the 1960s. And if they're on Google, they've got more information than the President of the United States did 15 years ago. Um, back in uh, the uh, 1700s, if you were royalty and you had guests coming over, if they were just friends, you would serve them on silver plates. And if they were you know, local royalty, you might sell them, serve them on gold plates. But if they were the top royalty, you would use aluminum plates. Aluminum was the rarest of elements. So we think about scarcity of resources. One of the examples I like to give is in the future, we are going to go out there and mine asteroids. Asteroids in our solar system are, in fact, one of the richest deposits of metals, uh, about uh, a, a class uh, a carbonaceous, a carbonaceous uh, LLC carbonaceous asteroid, uh, I'm sorry, LLC chondrite asteroid, which is about 17% of them out there, uh, have 50,000 times the enrichment of platinum that we do in Earth, on Earth. Uh, an average half kilometer asteroid of that type is worth something on the order of 20 to 30 trillion dollars. So we think about resource limitations. I want to think about AI and robotics and our ability to go out there and grasp these asteroids. A crazy idea today, but it will not be in 20 years. Uh, situation on launch today, if you go and you launch on the shuttle, it's an $800 million, billion dollar launch, $120 million a person. When Dan went up three times, he's a, he's a half a billion dollar man. Yeah, I've only given up once. Yeah. If you fly with us on the, uh, on the Soyuz, you know, you should go back and ask them for some. Um, if you fly in the Soyuz, it's about $100 million to launch, and one of my company's space adventures will take you up for now it's $45 million a seat. Uh, Soyuz is actually the most safest vehicle on the planet today, probably an order, probably two orders of magnitude safer than the shuttle. Dan's nodding his head. Here is the Soyuz above the Gulf of um, Arabia. And this is the only 20-star hotel um, around the space station, about the size of a football field. Uh, space Adventures has had the pleasure of taking uh, eight private clients up to the space station. Actually, it's seven clients, but one of them went twice. Dennis Tito, Mark Shuttleworth from South America, South, uh, South Africa, uh, Anusha Ansari, Charles Simone, who was our fifth and seventh customer. Richard Garriott, one of our XPRIZE trustees and the first second generation astronaut. Uh, his dad, Owen Garriott, was an Apollo uh, and, uh, and Skylab astronaut. And then our latest astronaut, uh, Guy Le Liberté, the founder of Cirque du Soleil, another proud Canadian. So it's expensive. But if you go and you calculate, and we'll do this experiment together right now, Take a 200 kilogram person, you can calculate the total amount of energy it takes to put you and your spacesuit into orbit. It's potential energy, mgh, pretty simple, right? And then 1 half mv squared to get kinetic energy. It's about 5.7 gigajoules. And if you spent that energy over the course of an hour, it's about 1.6 megawatts. And if you bought it off the grid here at 7 cents a kilowatt hour, how much does it cost to get you and your spacesuit into orbit? Any guesses? 
100 bucks. So the price improvement curve for opening the space frontier is from $100 million when Dan went to 100 bucks. Some incredible improvements. So how are we going to do that? Well, one of the X prizes I'm working on, which is exactly what SU is about. Space launch has not been about exponential growth, right? It's been pretty flat. The cost of going to orbit has actually been going up over time because of bureaucracy and the cost of labor. What percentage of a launch vehicle do you think is the cost of labor? Ideas? 50 percent. It's about, uh, about 80 to 90 percent. Cost, how much of it is fuel? One, about 1% one or less is fuel. It's labor. It's the cost of the people. When the shuttle program has no launches per year, it's $3 billion to launch no shuttles a year. The fourth shuttle cost $4 billion. The fifth shuttle cost $2.5 billion. The sixth, you know, basically, you start dividing that overhead in. It's expensive. It's a standing army of individuals. Turns out India will probably have the lowest cost of launch because the labor cost is low. <clears throat> so here's one idea that we're working on as an X prize. It's called a beam power launch prize, where you take actually solid state lasers or phased array microwave beamed antennas, which can be printed on fabs, and you beam the energy to the vehicle, which has hydrogen on board. And you can bring the cost of launch down by a factor of 100. But at the same time, the cost of the megawatt uh, lasers are coming down on Moore's Law. So I'm going to uh, run through this very quickly and just to familiarize you with it. Uh, my job has been to try and create companies that drive excitement and drive marketplaces. One of them is a company called Rocket Racing, where it's, uh, I'm just going to flip through this. It's, uh, it's NASCAR racing with rockets. We announced that our first race is coming up this April. Um, uh, if you just hit the top video on there for me, I'll give you a flavor of this. The first year of rocket racing will feature 10x racers that will blast their way along a three-dimensional sky course. So you get the idea that these are flying through virtual rings in the sky where the pilot has a heads-up display and they see the ring, and you on at home or uh, are watching on TV with augmented reality where you see the race course superimposed or in the stands on the jumbotrons you're seeing this. So all the technology is done and the vehicle has now uh, gone through its test flights and we'll be rolling it out and here's a uh, very short video. Armadillo is building our engines for us. We can lower, lower the volume for me a little bit. So these are LOX alcohol engines, liquid oxygen and alcohol, which are normally cl uh, fire clear blue. We actually add sodium or strontium. We color the flames. So every vehicle is a different color flame. And uh, these vehicles are basically more of a punch than an F-16 on afterburners. And you control on and off, as you'll see the pilot over here. So you toggle the thrust. And it's how you use the energy going through this race course that makes it a competitive sport. So you'll see I'm toggling off the, uh, the throttle here. And toggling it back on. Rolls and loops with rocket-powered vehicles. All right, so stay tuned for the first uh, public race, April 24th. Uh, we debuted it uh, with DKNY as our sponsor at Oshkosh. That was pretty cool. Uh, the last subject I want to tell you about is zero G. Uh, I used to wonder when I was a kid where there was zero gravity room was. And uh, I wanted so bad to be a NASA astronaut that I volunteered to do medical experiments on NASA's zero G airplane because I found out there was no zero G room and the best I could do was hope to get on their airplane. They told me no. So I said, OK, then I'll do it myself, which is my usual reaction someone says no. And uh, Byron Lichtenberg, Ray Cronice, and I set out in 1993 to try and do this. We went to the FAA. We said we'd like to take a large airplane and do what NASA's been doing for the last 40 years.
basically put 35 people in the back, have the airplane go up at a 45 degree angle of attack, get people out of their seatbelts, push it over the top, and the lawyer said, you want to do what? No. And um, they literally, they told me, no, it cannot be done, and we will not allow you to do it. At which point I, I said, I don't understand. They said, show me in the rules where it says you can do this. And I said, show me in the rules where it says I can't do this. And it hit me that all of a sudden in society, we've gone from, from a society where if something was not prohibitively disallowed, you could do it, to a society where if it's not explicitly allowed, you can't do it. And that's a very dangerous change. So 11 years and three administrations later, we became operational. It was an 11-year startup, and this was something which I refused to give up on. We've since done, uh, we've flown over 10,000 people into zero G, over 200 flights. This is the uh, world's fastest roller coaster. Weight loss program over the top, guaranteed 100% of your weight, and weight gain on the bottom. We do 15 parabolas during a typical commercial flight. And I'll give you a little flavor of this. We turn the volume up just for the neck for 30 seconds. There's Kristen. All right. So, if you saw a few shots of uh, of Kristen floating around in there as well. Um, we operate out of the Kennedy Space Center and out of uh, Las Vegas for obvious reasons, and. Um, one of the coolest things I had the chance to do was to fly the world's expert in gravity in zero G. So you remember earlier I mentioned to you that Stephen Hawking is having his genome sequence as part of the Archon X Prize for Genomics. And in my first conversation with him, he expressed his excitement about space. And I said, I can't fly into space right now, but I can fly into zero G. And he said, yes, instantly. And uh, I naively went out the next you know, week and announced it to the world with a press release and received two phone calls. One from a government agency who I won't mention, but their uh, initials are the FAA. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the second was from our aircraft partner who said, uh, you can't do this. You're only allowed to fly able-bodied people. And someone said no again to me, so I said, okay, we'll see. Uh, and it took six months to change the rules, to get all of his doctors to sign him off as an able-bodied person to fly in zero G, which they did. And um, since we're on camera, I will not mention the rest of the, uh, of the equation there. But at the end of the day, six months after we announced it, we ended up at the Kennedy Space Center with Stephen Hawking and a giant press conference and he was asked, why are you doing this? Why are you, and you have to remember, <clears throat> when I announced this, people said, you know, Diamandis, you're crazy, for God's sakes. You're going to kill the world-famous physicist. What are you doing? You're, you're going to destroy your company. And, and I knew that I would either get a lot of publicity or a lot of publicity. <laughs> and I just wanted a lot of publicity. But this was exactly why we built this company, to give people, everybody a chance to go and do this. That you know, if you have a dream, you should be able to go and make these things happen. And so Stephen Hawking is there, and he's being interviewed by the media, and they said, why are you doing this? And he said something very important, which I want to carry the message to all of you. He said, uh, unless the human race gets off the planet, I don't think we have a future, that we are in such a perilous time from the potential impact of asteroids or 
of man-made disaster, bio-disaster, and so forth, that we need to, he didn't use these terms, a friend of mine, Elon Musk, used these terms, back up the biosphere. And that we, in one sense, have a moral obligation to do that. That we have the ability as a species now to back ourselves up and to create frontiers for exploration and for many reasons. And he said, I want to give publicity to these commercial space ventures. What he didn't say as well is, and I've been stuck in this wheelchair for 40 years, for God's sake, because I want to go and fly. <laughs> so we set up a full emergency room on board this airplane. We had four ER doctors and three nurses. We were monitoring him for blood pressure, PO2, heart rate. This man had severe osteoporosis, severe you know, cardiac conditions. Uh, we actually flew a whole test flight the day before with a 15-year-old a uh, high school kid who loved physics, who had the same weight, and we practiced, you know, uh, cardiac arrest and bradycardia and every emergency uh, procedure on him. And we uh, took off from the Kennedy Space Center with uh, hundreds of media there off of the SLF, the shuttle landing facility. And here is Byron, one of the co-founders, and myself slowly lifting him up. You can see the tube carrying the wires back to the uh, to the monitoring station. Now, Dr. Hawking has no control of his body except for a few facial muscles, but he has full sensation. And here we are, you know, levitating him. And you can see sort of a mix of, of anxiety and, and pleasure on his face there, right? And when we went up, we said, we're going to do one parabolic arc. We're going to give this guy 30 seconds of zero G. And if it goes really well, we might do two or three. That we were setting expectations again. And you can see the smile on his face. The first problem went great. You know, I looked to our, our physicians there. They gave us a thumbs up. So we did a second parabola and, and a third parabola. And we were, we were floating an apple in homage to Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> right? Also because Sir Isaac Newton held the same chair that Stephen Hawking currently does at Cambridge. And we did a fourth and a fifth and a sixth parabola. And the sixth parabola, I'm negotiating with him. Please, stop. <laughs> I do not want to, you know, to ruin this thing. And here he is on his eighth parabola, and he was having a blast. And on the heels of that success, last year we took up uh, four kids who had never walked uh, into zero G, and here they are. And we're now working uh, with, um, with the Christopher Reeve Foundation. Uh, this year we want to launch a program to fly 100 uh, kids who are wheelchair bound every year. So, I'm going to end on this slide, and hopefully we'll bring in the wine and have the, uh, the conversation with the notion that there is nothing impossible. Maybe some laws of physics that get in our way, maybe the speed of light, but all the problems we have on this planet, people will tell you no. They will say you can't do it. And maybe they can't do it. doesn't mean you can't do it. And rules and regulations will stand in your way. And it will take you 10 years to do something you want, or maybe 11. But if you love it, if you love it in your heart, if it's what you're meant to do, then you will not give up. And you will find the people, and you will find the technology, and you will change the rules and regulations, and you will make it happen. Because it's what you're meant to do. And we can solve every problem on this planet. There is nothing we cannot do. At the end of the day, it's up to you and your persistence and your heart because the most critical tool in solving all the grand challenges is the passionate and persistent human mind. Thank you. What is the one uh, breakthrough that you've seen that excites you the most? What, what's the one that you would grab and, and go running with and spend 11 years trying to get done? Wow. Uh, yeah, uh, God. Um, Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it, is, it is all of them. I mean, I'm, I, some of the ideas that hit me when we were, we were doing the, uh, the what-if exercise before, 
what, one of the things that hit me is when are we going to start to uh, design robots biologically instead of electromechanically? You know, when will you start, instead of the Roomba, you're going to design a carpet cleaner that pees stain remover and likes to eat lint. <laughs> and I'm serious. We're going to, I think there is an age ahead of us where we're going to start to bioengineer a lot of the mechanical things. And in fact, I wonder in terms of space exploration when our satellites will be, become living organisms in some sense. So that's what I, I wonder about. But there are, I mean, I, I know a lot of you are here who have sold companies or in the venture world and are looking at making investments. I mean, there, on this wall are, you know, probably dozens of hundred billion dollar opportunities. And isn't it kind of strange to be staring at it and knowing somewhere over there, maybe behind Keith, maybe behind Justina, there's a hundred billion dollar opportunity. If you just pick the right one, or combine the right two things. And then the other thing that I think about is this. That those technologies in combinations can solve ubiquitous clean water, ubiquitous energy, ubiquitous environmental safeties, sanitation, that the challenges we have can be solved and that it's a matter of the right combinations and the right focus. And that's, I think, the underlying ethos for SU and what, what drives me, you know, the, the notion that there are grand challenges, but they are solvable. Questions? Conversations? Please. Bob. Yeah, thanks. You're, you're just saying, I know. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll... Um, I was talking with Daniel Kraft earlier about the, uh, uh, the issue in medicine, which is our regulatory structures and the bureaucracies that are designed to protect people, but uh, are somewhat incongruent with innovation and some of the things like personalized medicine. So I was kind of inspired by one of your goals in the XPRIZE about actually driving change in regulatory structures if they don't support you know, the current model of innovation. So um, I don't know if I have a question so much as just, I, I, it sort of opened my mind to the possibility that uh, it's not necessarily a limitation, the way that FDA is structured in the process, that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that, uh, that there could be ways to, to change it. So you sparked something. Thank you for that, for that thought. I had also a, uh, a moment of clarity, one of these inspirational moments when Daniel was speaking earlier. And it's the realization that the healthcare problem, we have a serious healthcare problem, the costs are going up and so forth, is going to be solved by no action of the government, but it's going to be solved by action of the people, the industries that are coming that are going to organically grow and solve the issues in a different way. So here's what I mean. We knew 20 or 30 years ago that we didn't know how we're going to feed the billions of people on this planet and the Green Revolution happened. I want to you to think about what we heard about the, uh, the, the uh, the consumer groups getting together, the genome sequencing, the monitoring of health and such. Imagine if technologies bring the cost down of healthcare by factors of 10 or 100, that, that those mechanisms are going to, under, in one sense, rescue the healthcare problem. And I, I had for the first time today uh, this, this sense that it could really happen, that the technologies coming in could, could fundamentally change the economics of healthcare and save our butts, both domestically and abroad. Can I yeah, please. I'm in the industry, and, and uh, I totally, I, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the issues is, is there's a monopolistic. It's not just a bureaucracy. There's a monopolistic aspect to it. It's not just IP. It's also about information arbitrage, right? So if you have uh, people being able to go on WebMD right now, which is not terrific, but they have a lot more information than they used to. Uh, patients are going in with a much more negotiated position with physicians. If you succeed in the XPRIZE to have an AI agent for the physician, it's, it may not be you know, as good, maybe it is as good as the physician, but, but the knowledge of how you might solve it without having to rely on the system for an answer, as well as potentially the ability, you know, people can already go black market to get certain solutions, uh, you know, like pharma products and other things. So it's, it's interesting because uh, actually if, if, you, if you have kind of empower 
the groups uh, with some of these technologies that are just going to happen on their own, then the, the, the ability to control centrally how healthcare is delivered really gets sort of messed up. And, and by the way, just to be, to be clear about this, uh, you know, no one gets this more than the White House does right now that are looking for innovation. I mean, we have probably one of the most frequent dialogues we have is with OSTP and looking at education X prizes, healthcare X prizes, AI physician, and so they want innovation more than anybody. Because what happens is there's, there's a struggle between corporations trying to protect their, their positions, right? And lobbying firms, and you get things stuck. But ultimately, the exponential change is gonna change the cost equation. So everybody who's been holding their position is gonna crumble under a brand new cost economic paradigm. Uh, there was another question here, and then... Yeah. Uh, Peter, the, you were very enthusiastic about space. At the same time, you know, we all have to think about you know, paying our bills and, and making a business case. Also, among the things on the wall, effectively, you have to take an idea and, and build a business case for it. Well, at what time did you decide to make a business case out of the X-Prize and space ventures, or, or, or did it just grow? So, and and, and coupled yeah. to that, there may be, I mean, you, you have an enormous network, was it the chicken or the egg? Yeah. So my personal passion for space, thank you, Hans, for the, for the question. My, my personal, and oh, in the back, right behind you, Shauna. Um, my personal passion for the XPRIZE actually grew out of the Apollo program, right? I was a kid when Apollo was happening. And I had this amazing moment where I just, you know, if you ever, anyone ever had a calling in life where you have a, a mission and a purpose in life? Well, my mission and purpose in life was opening space. It's what's driven me since my childhood. I remember a conversation with my mom, and I said, Mom, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to open up space. And she goes, that's nice, son, but you're going to be a doctor. And, I <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up going to medical school. I finally, when I finished that, I said, OK, now I can go focus on space. Um, I wish it was funny. I wish it was a joke, but it's true. <laughs> um, and, and so what I realized along the lines was to that space could no longer be dependent on, on what it was in the 60s, which was a political, inspirational goal. It was great, right? It drove all kinds of benefits. But as soon as we landed on the moon and beat the Soviets, the engine stopped. And so I said, we need an economic engine. We need an exothermic economic reaction. We need to make more money in space. So I started thinking about what are the businesses that could be viable? And the first business was tourism. Right? So that's why myself and Greg and Eric Anderson and a small group of individuals, Jeff Bezos, Richard Brantz and others, became focused on human space flight. You know, the total global commercial market for satellites, commercial market for satellites around the world is how many? How many commercial satellites are launched per year? And if you know the space, if you're a space person, don't answer. OK, so the normal people say it's 50, 100. It's about a dozen. A, a dozen commercial launches per year. How many commercial launch companies are in there around the world? <laughs> about 15. About, so when you look at commercial companies, there's a couple of Russian ones. The Chinese will launch commercially. Indians, Japanese, European, US, about 15. So you've got 15 suppliers and 12 customers. What kind of business is that? It's I mean, why would anybody ever cut the cost of the launch service? You cut it by half, and you just destroyed half your revenue. So it's stuck there. The prices go up. So you need a new marketplace. And, and, and Greg and I say, you know, the marketplace is us. It's self-loading carbon payloads. They come with their own money. They're fun to make. Okay, the time delay on that one was a little bit quicker than usual. <laughs> anyway, so that was it. Now, the next marketplace is resources, energy, minerals, metals, everything we hold of value on Earth, the things we fight wars over, real estate, minerals, energy, all these things are in infinite quantities in space. The Earth is a crumb in a supermarket filled with resources. Please. Um, uh, an observation followed up by a question. Sure. In the context of, let's say, the DARPA, um, the road challenge, could do that. We even heard yesterday that it would not have happened had not had the failure before. 
So uh, I guess my observation is it took a little bit of umbrage at calling the, the, the work, the $200 million before the success, yeah, um, a little bit of ridicule that, well, to go do that. But it would not have happened without. Same thing for X-15 had not those engineers learned how to do those things, how that technology had not entered the, in, you know, the, you could go buy the components instead of inventing the components, you could not have done it. I mean, everybody stands on the shoulders of, of giants to, to get there. So that's my observation. Please. And, and it would be the case that it's better to not ridicule the people that can help when they can help. So the real question is, and uh, we live in an interdependent world of government and, and entrepreneurship and uh, non-governmental organizations and all the pieces there. So what role could the, does the government have in helping things, you know, sincere offer to, to help things? Um, so, so is it, some people would say get out of the way, some people say, you know, fund everything. What's the balance and what, what would your view be on the role of the government to get out of stuff and go move forward? So let me address the first point, which is you're absolutely right. And let me, uh, let me be clear for the record that uh, I have a tendency that I need to get over to sort of create the battle between government and, and entrepreneur. So the fact of the matter is uh, it wasn't in fact, in, in fact in the, uh, for the autonomous cars, it was the large contractors. It wasn't the government people. It was the contractors who were not in this example performing. But Clearly, as, uh, as Sebastian Thrun, who, won, who was heading, of, heading the Stanford team, uh, would have said, he built on the work done before. So absolutely correct. It just makes for a better story when I say it the other way. So apologies to those individuals. Um, and the X-15 example is not really uh, anything negative. I know the X-15 people, in that day and age, in the late 50s and 60s, people were taking incredible risks and working as hard as they could. The point I was trying to make there was not a good-bad example, but a look how technology has empowered us. That technology has now made it possible for smaller teams to do things much quicker because the work of a single individual can do the work of 100 engineers before, uh, enabled by expert systems and computers. Um, we actually have a great relationship with, uh, with the government, and uh, I didn't point this out. Department of Energy underwrites a lot of the work that we do in the Progressive Automotive X Prize. They're our partners. Um, NASA has been a great partner for us, and we're working closely with the White House. And so I do think that government today has a, has a challenge, which is they have a hard time taking really risky things that could fail big and publicly because there's somebody, uh, there's a congressman or a senator who's going to uh, call them to task and you know, the uh, inspector general investigates people left and right. And same as large corporations have a great worry about doing something risky because their stock price will plummet. And so I, I'm, one of my biggest concerns is we don't do risky enough things that we're killing ourselves how risk adverse we've gotten. You know, and I'm speaking as an American here. Um, so I think prizes can be ways of taking risk off balance sheet. So I'm excited about working with the US government on prizes, either to support their prizes or to have them support our prizes. Other questions? Yeah. I mean, uh, given that there's climate change, and you know, I think when you talk about age of abundance, with climate change and with you know, you know, a growing population, uh, if we if we just stick to planet Earth, I think we are highly constrained, right? And I think when you refer to Asia of islands, I, I assume you're not just talking about Earth. I mean, I think you did talk about going to mine resources in the asteroids and so on. And I read an article on the way to San Francisco in National Geographic, and they said that if they do anything to Mars in order for us to use it, it takes at least a hundred years. If we do anything for which? Mars. To Mars. To Mars. In order for us to use it, mm. to, you know, like human beings would use it, it would take at least 100 years to do various things like change the weather and the, the soil. So we need, to create, we need to create at SU some kind of a call out when we hear something that is a linear projection instead of an exponential projection, right? That was before I came to Of course. <laughs> and, and, and clearly the author has not done that. But... Um, 
has not come to SU, but you can imagine how people can view those as linear things. But now, imagine if you would that in 20, 30 years, we're going to have amazing robots and amazing uh, levels of AI agents, if you would, uh, biotechnology. I mean, if you wanted to terraform Mars, if you wanted to start cro to cause significant change, I mean, the real issue is not going to be the technology side. It's going to be the people calling for the protection of Mars, you know, who are going to say, who has the right to change this? And ultimately, I think that's one of the reasons that we're going to end up really looking at uh, building uh, non-planetary biospheres where we start to cobble together uh, large asteroids and create living experiences there. But if you wanted to go to Mars, I think in, in 30 years' time, we'll bioengineer things to, to, to modify that. So on your asteroids uh, idea, hmm. uh, have you considered having an X prize or mega X prize to launch a vehicle to one of those asteroids sure. and bring back a rock? So the same vehicles that the Google Lunar X prize teams are doing can get to the asteroids. In fact, it takes less energy to get to the surface of ast mo uh, many asteroids than it does to get to the surface of the moon. Because you're not entering and exiting a gravity well when you go to an asteroid. And there are hundreds and thousands of asteroids that are within a lower delta V energy change requirement than, uh, than the Earth's moon. So. so just to follow that through, but don't just get a rock. <laughs> go to that. Three. Just a little brainstorm. Go to the thing and demonstrate a one pico newton nudge. Right to claim it. To claim. It. Yes, yeah. e exactly right. So and, and that proves that if you put enough pico newtons nudges, you could deflect it before hitting the earth. And, and that is something we have talked about: a deflection X prize, which would be uh, choose an asteroid of a certain size that is not in <laughs> Earth's plane. In other words, even if you moved it as much as you wanted, you couldn't hit the Earth, right? And then. <laughs> Which is important. Um, and, and then demonstrate, call your shot. Say we're going to move it a certain amount, and then move it that amount, and you'd win the, uh, win the prize. Because it's interesting, there are, you know, we now think we know about 80% of the asteroids out there uh, above, a cert above a size that can uh, penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. But there are many asteroids, like the one that hit um, about a year, 18 months ago, that we caught it two days before it entered the Earth's atmosphere. We, we visualized it. And, and the hyperbolic comet orbits we don't know about. And ones, exactly, ones that are coming from, from the sun towards us, so we're blinded to them. Uh, and you know, we could wake up one day and find out that there's a killer asteroid coming in a week's time. I mean, I used to pray that there would be an asteroid that would destroy the Earth coming at us, but with a 20-year head start. <laughs> you know, talk, uh, 20, yeah, yeah, talk about galvanizing, talking about galvanizing the Earth and making our differences so small. That would be one of them. 20 years is enough time. Yes, Shauna? So, Peter, while I have the mic, um, <laughs> <laughs> the power, <laughs> So one question I have for you is, I mean, you set out started wanting to fundamentally change space and space exploration, but the unintended consequence is you've been changing the way that people think, which is a very, very powerful and positive side consequence. Um, and I want to take that idea a little bit further um, and take that to education, because I don't think any of us would, would argue the point that there's something fundamentally wrong with education, the way we teach kids growing up. So I'd like to open up this discussion to all of us, actually, and say, what do we need to be doing as soon as kids get into school um, to be changed in the way they think so that they won't grow up wanting to change the world? Because those kids are too far and few, few and far between. So uh, education is an area that I think about a lot because it's probably one of the most important areas that we could create an X prize in. And uh, having started with, uh, with Bob and a number of folks here, both ISU and SU, you know, education is important. Uh, the question is at what stage of what age uh, and what, what area. And I just, uh, we, we think about that, and that's probably a conversation that I'd, I'd love to take back to the lodge a little bit more. But uh, I'll point out that the educational system we have today is over 100 years old, and it's based on an agrarian society where you get, you know, summer off to go and, and you know, 
get your crops in and you end at three and so forth. And the technology we have today can reinvent education in an incredible way. So I do believe that education will be invent, reinvented over the years ahead. I mean, you split education into socialization functions, childcare functions, and education functions. Those are three very distinct and important elements of it. And in the education function, uh, the way it's done right now, I think, is, um, is failing miserably uh, compared to what it could be. So um, it's a long conversation. So I'm happy to happy to have that as a, as a group group later. Other other questions? Can you tell me a little bit more about the brain computer interface challenge, the BCI? Um, so we're looking for one. We're looking for a great brain computer interface challenge. Again, something which is measurable, definable, and not pre-guessing how someone would do it. We don't have one yet. We're looking for someone who will underwrite the design of that prize and ultimately fund the prize. So we're just starting to think of it. Our XPRIZE lab at MIT had a session and uh, came up with about a dozen different ideas. Um, I know I can, I can name a couple of them, but, uh, but we don't have one yet. But the notion is, I think about when, it, when we design these prizes, I think about uh, the turning the knobs and having something that is uh, audacious but achievable. So again, I don't want to go to orbit when I can just go to 50, you know, 100 kilometers, 50 times harder. So what's the first, what's a brain computer interface prize that people say, wow, they did that. And then, but it's achievable and so that capital comes now to take it to the next level and next level and next level. So not non-invasive. So, so again, these are the parameters that we'll that we'll figure out. So we will study this area and find a prize or two or three prize ideas that's inspirational, telegenic, that a young group of 20 graduate students could do, that would be a first step to demonstrate that direction, um, and that would move us. You know, the ultimate you know Google on the brain, so to speak, uh, will be the nth uh, degree of that evolution. But to begin with. It's a first step. What is that first step that is significant and meaningful? If you have good ideas, let us know. And we, I, can, I can rattle off a bunch of ideas later. But. Hi. Um, on the list of things you gave that were important for innovation, was that an input into the, 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 the prize, if you like, in terms of this is what you thought would be successful, or was that an output in terms of observations of what was successful? So it's, it's an observation of, what, uh, of what's been successful. So for example, you know, you look at Apple computers and how when Steve Jobs wanted to create the iPod and the iTunes, you know, he took that small team and isolated it. Uh, here at SU, for example, during the summers, one of the things I'm proudest of is that the companies that came out this summer, we have an innovation engine we've created, right? On one end of the equation, the first week of the summer program, of the graduate student program, we focus the students on what are the world's biggest challenges? What are they, what is, what has failed with water? What, what is the challenge, what's failed in energy, in water, in poverty, in, you know, in environment? And then we take them through four weeks of what you've done in two days, of all these exponential technologies. And then we break them up into small teams, 10, 12 people, and we say, given these problems, given this kind of technology, what ideas will you come up with that are new companies or new projects that mix this all up in new ways to address these issues? So we incentivize them. We put them into small groups, diverse backgrounds, right? They're lawyers and doctors. Yes, we have some lawyers. And doctors and engineers and scientists in all the different areas and with impassion them to come up, and they came up with four amazing companies last year as the output from it, which have gotten seed funding and are addressing the grand challenges in the beginning. So it's an innovation engine that we're trying to create here at SU. And we'd really love to have many of you come back and mentor these students. Uh, we've had some of, the, uh, of our uh, associate founders come in and invest in the companies that are coming out of it. So it's really a culture of innovation and excitement of the mixing and matching of what goes on here. So, could you say a bit more about the, um, the diverse backgrounds? Because that's something I'm interested in. in terms of what, what, what difference that made? So, I mean, the diverse background of a team 
If you've got everybody who's an aerospace engineer focused on aerospace, you know, you may not come up with the idea of a beamed energy prize unless you had an electrical engineer who happened to be working in microwaves and said, you know, what if we had the energy from over here? So it's really, or a biologist coming in, I mean, we talked about biological computing. You know, so it's really, the breakthroughs are from orthogonal points of view. So somebody who's smart, but with a completely different set of approaches, is going to look at a problem from a completely different way. And that's where breakthroughs come from. So I'm going to leave you on that note. I want to wrap up by, by saying, again, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, we are, you know, we're doing this to, to try and create a new perception of thinking and to really drive some new breakthroughs in the world. So uh, we welcome you to the SU family. We're going to ask you to please help us improve this and grow what we're doing here. This is not something we hope that you're going to have come through and then left. This is a community. And the SU community is something that's very important to us. So give us your ideas. Help us build it. You know, help bring, improve this. And 7.15 tomorrow morning, smart bells. We'll get you. All right. Thank you.